Well, good morning. I don't know about you, but I knew we were going to pay for that good weather. <laughs> if you don't know why that was a cheeky statement, then you can ask somebody around you who left. So um, if you're new, you may not know that. But uh, So this morning, every, every year in January, we always want to spend at least one Sunday Sometimes a couple, sometimes three, it just depends. But we want to reorient ourselves around who God has called us to be. And we have an identity statement in our church. And if you're new with us, you may not um, know that. You may see it like on the website or around, and you may not know what it means. But we have an ident- identity statement that is, we are God's family on mission. And that is very, um, it's both very simple on the surface, but it also, you can dig much deeper into that. And so um, everything kind of comes around that idea, idea that it's, um, God cares more about who we are in him than what we do for him. And that's a, that, that's a really challenging thing for a lot of us, especially those of us who grew up in the church, because often it kind of gets swayed and we think more about what we do for God than who we are in Christ. It comes out a lot when I ask people, like, hey, how's your faith been going? Like, what, would you say this is a strong season? Would you say it's, um, a, you're struggling? Like, how would you describe your faith? And, and most of the time, we respond with the things that we do. Well, I've been, I've really been reading the Bible a lot, or I've been coming to church a lot, or I haven't really been in the Word, and I've really been struggling in my prayer life. And we always define We tend to want to define our relationship with God by what we do rather than who we are. And so we want to always put that front and center that we are called to be God's family on mission. And that's who we are because that's who Jesus says we are. It's not who we are because we did enough and proved enough that that that's who we are. It's not who we are because that's perfectly who we are. We say that that's who Jesus says we are. And at the same time, in, in our imperfection, in, in, the fa- in the, the, this time where it's an already not yet situation, that it is who we are and also who we are becoming. And this week, today, going into this year, I want, I want to focus our attention on how do, we, how do we pray for that to become our identity more and more? How do we commit ourselves? Because we can say, okay, we want to be God's family and mission. And sometimes by growing into that, we say, okay, I'm going to try harder to be that. But we know that's not the way it works. And so we wanted to focus and really reorient ourselves this year around praying that God would do the work that only he can do. Last week, Jeff did a great job of stirring our hearts for prayer in general. Reminding us of what Jesus has said about prayer, that it is relational and powerful and joyful. And if you've struggled in your prayer life at all, or even if you feel, even if you haven't, I would encourage you, if you missed last week, to to listen to that message online, because it was fantastic. We get to approach the throne of grace with confidence because of his love for us. He works powerfully through our prayer And all of that deepens our joy. And so what I want us to do is commit ourselves this year. If you would join with us in the past, we've done different things in January where we've said, hey, this year we want to focus on this. We've done Bible reading plans together. We've committed to different actions together. But but today, what I want to do is just give you three prayers to pray this year centered around our identity as God's family on mission. And in that, I'll, if you're new to that language and new to us, then I'm also going to be giving a, a crash course on what does this mean that we are God's family on mission and what do I, do I want us to pray together. And, and I think it's important, by the way, that we, that we commit some of these things to, to pray together. We do all kinds of things together. We do Bible studies together. We worship together. We sing together. And so here I'm going to give in the form of three passages, three passages of Scripture that I would just encourage us What would it look like if all of us said, I'm going to pray that this year. I'm going to pray that daily, and let's see what happens. So we are God's family on mission. First, we are God's. 
And what do we mean when we say that we are God's? We mean that we belong to him. He redeems us. He buys us back from sin. And so we make a big deal about that apostrophe in God's. We belong to him. Paul says in Romans 6, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Here's the word picture that Paul is using. He's saying at once you were were a slave to sin, meaning you were controlled by sin, compelled by sin. And and by sin, we don't just mean bad things that people do. We We mean rebellion against God's kingdom, that you are controlled and compelled by your own desires for your own kingdom to fulfill your own purpose. And Paul's saying, that's that's who you were, but Christ has redeemed you. He has bought you back. He has set you free. He has brought you out of slaves so that now you become a slave of righteousness. And that feels like weird language, but essentially what he's saying is you, at one point before Christ, were compelled. You had no choice but to follow the desires of your own flesh, to serve your own kingdom, to your own end. But he's saying now, because of what Christ has done, you are now compelled by righteousness. You belong to righteousness. That is who you are. It's a declaration of a reality that what Christ has done in you, that he has exchanged your sin and my sin and given us his righteousness. In short, our life is not our own. Or as Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And that passage right there, that verse, is, one, is the first prayer that I want us to pray. That if you would be so inclined that the Lord would move you to say, yes, I want to I wanna be more united here. I want us together as a family. Then this, this is the verse that I would encourage us to pray together. That we would grow in being a people who have been crucified with Christ. That we would grow in Christ-likeness through being reminded that we are not our own. See, following Jesus is not about you living your own life with just a a Christian flavor to it. I say this all the time because it's just so common, especially in a culture like ours, that it, where it's fine to be a Christian. Now, we often um, talk about like, oh, it's, how, it's hard to be a Christian here. The culture is turning or whatever. But if you've been around the world, you know that this is still an incredibly friendly place towards Christians. Like we have Chick-fil-A. Most of the world doesn't get Chick-fil-A, all right? That's a, that right there shows God's blessing in our lives. And, um, and so like we have this idea that, okay, it, it's... It, to follow Jesus often is like, okay, but this is my life and I'm basically a good person and I have good desires and so I want to do these good things for God and then I'm going to ask God to bless my kingdom, my way, my path. And yeah, God, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to do it in, a, in an honest way. I'm going to try to be kind to people. I'm going to you know, work hard and, and all this. But what we don't realize is that even in the midst of that, what we're saying is, Lord, I, I'm going to be my own king of my own kingdom And I'm willing to kind of create an alliance with you, but I'm not submitting to you. That's not being crucified with Christ. To be crucified with Christ means on the cross, I put my own flesh, my own desires, my own kingdom, my own sin, and I die to it. And I raise to live with Christ. We find my identity in him. He sets me free so that I'm not compelled by my sinful desires, but by the Holy Spirit. And what that means is that everything the Bible calls us to, the Holy Spirit empowers us to be. So he says that that old self is not you anymore. This is the new you, and that's who you actually are. And he's saying, I'm going to make you more and more into that. So one of the things that we talk about is, I don't know about you, but when I grew up reading the Bible and I saw the commands of Scripture, that I would say, man, that's, that's a lot. I don't know if I can handle all that. And then I would try to do stuff, and I'd try to be more faithful. I'd try to do what the Bible told me to do, and then I would fail, and I would feel badly about it, and then I would, I would act like the gospel was that Jesus forgave me for my sins, and now I'm just going to try really hard to not disappoint him. 
And I don't know about you, but if you've grown up in anything like that, if, if, you've, if your faith has been a lot of that, I just want to let you know that it's way better than that. That everything that the Bible commands, this is a phrase that you'll hear us say, um, hopefully repeatedly, but the commands of Scripture are not a law to live up to. They're not a bar that we have to live up to or achieve. They are promises being fulfilled in us. So when Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, he's not saying, do better at that. Try harder. If you want to be in the kingdom, then this is what you have to do. What he's saying is that's what the kingdom, that's how the kingdom functions. And if you are a citizen of the kingdom, then that's who you are becoming. You are going to be a person who loves their enemies and prays for those who persecute you. You are a person who will be who will forgive as you have been forgiven. And if you're like me, it can sometimes feel overwhelming. It can feel slow. I'm not as patient or kind or generous as I want to be or I know that I should be. And so that struggle and that battle and the already not yet that who Jesus says I am is not who I'm always experiencing. But he's saying, it is who you are and I'm going to make sure of it. And it turns out that obedience to Christ is more about believing who he says you are than it is about willpower. It is more about trusting the Holy Spirit's power than your own to bring change. And it's meant to be joyful and exciting. Let's say that you're going to renovate your house from the ground up. And you go around your house and you, you say all the things that you would, would want to redo or improve or rebuild. And so you come up with a list and it includes like, well, we need to fix some parts of the foundation. And then room by room you go through and say, I want to I replace the flooring here. This needs new paint. I'd love to add uh, you know, a little room onto this side of the house. I would like to put some more windows over here. And that's a lot of work. If you've ever done that and gone through your house and thought, man, what would I like to do to this house? It starts to get overwhelming. And if I'm responsible to do all of that, to make the list and to, and to figure out how to do it, that is a lot of work. For me, that means a lot of YouTube videos over and over and over again, step by step. A lot of trips to Menards, right? And in the end, really shoddy work, really hit and miss. For me personally, if that was my job, and that's, I would be excited for a split second. You watch some show or whatever, and you think, oh, we could, we could add a screened-in porch. We could do this. And I would, I would be excited for just a second until I realized, oh, that's all dependent on me, and now I have to do all of that. And eventually, I would fail and then feel awful about it. And if everybody was doing the same thing, I'd probably end up comparing our renovations to everybody else's. But imagine that you're going to do the same thing, but you have a contractor, the world's best contractor. And he has committed to working side by side with you. And his work is impeccable. And he says, hey, if you trust me, this house will be completely new. All you have to do is hang with me and do what I ask. And as you work with him, you realize he's, he's really patient with you. And every time you're not sure if you did the right thing, he gently forms it into what it should be. He always knows what the next step is. He never forgets anything at Menards. And his work is always perfect. And little by little, you see the room take shape. And it's amazing. And pretty soon, as you're working alongside of him, pretty soon the other rooms don't feel quite as overwhelming. Pretty soon they, they feel kind of exciting. You might ask him, can we do that one next? This bathroom's awesome. Can we, can we do the bedroom next? Can we add the screened-in porch next? Now, like all renovations, it is messy and it takes time. But the confidence of knowing that it all will be done, the excitement of what you're becoming, and how strangely restful the work is, 
and the joy of working alongside this great contractor will overcome everything else. Because he's not a contractor that stands in the corner drinking coffee, barking out orders, demanding perfection. He's one that works alongside you. He says, I know who you really are. And that is who I am forming you into. Hang in there. Hang with me. I will complete the work. Do you want that kind of renovation in your life? Then ask him. Where do you see consistent struggles in your life that you say, I don't want that to be who I am, but I don't know how to not be that way? Do you lack compassion or patience? Do you find yourself falling into jealousy or bitterness? Then pray. Ask God, Lord, change me. Renovate my heart. How does that work? Well, let's say you notice yourself lacking compassion. And you say, that's, that's not actually who I am anymore. That in my old self, my old flesh, I, I tended to be judgmental and to look at people and say, well, you get what you deserve. And so if you work hard, you'll get what you have. And if you don't, then, then, you, then you won't. And, and so if, you, if you're in a bad situation, it's probably your own fault. And you say, that's, that's not who I am anymore. I'm in Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so you pray, Lord, give me compassion. I want your compassion. It's your life that I want to live. And so you ask him for that. And then God gives you opportunities to demonstrate compassion in faith as he is with you. And then the Holy Spirit forms your heart and grows that compassion. And notice that step that I put in there. This is why I'm using the renovation of a house where he's saying, look, you're going to work alongside of me. It doesn't depend on my work. He is ultimately doing the work, but he invites us into that process. And the process that he invites us into is that we pray for something and then he gives us opportunity to demonstrate faithfulness and obedience. And then empowered by the Holy Spirit, we obey and are formed more into the likeness of him. So hear this. Just praying to be more compassionate with no obedience will not yield compassion. But neither will trying really hard and white-knuckling the, the appearance of compassion. That will also not make you more compassionate. Only a confession of your flesh desire of judgment, for example, and then believing that Christ has already given you this new identity as one who is full of compassion, and then responding in faith when he says, I have given you my compassion. Walk in it. That is when you'll grow in compassion. And then as you do that more and more and more, it becomes more natural. And it becomes more natural because you are actually, in reality, being formed into the image of Christ. And if you will abide in him, he will joyfully do that with you, room by room, increasing your joy, your anticipation, and your confidence, your faith. So this year, let's, let's grow in our identity in Christ. Let's pray this together. Let's pray that we would be who Christ calls us to be, that we would be able to declare to one another and be a body who says we are crucified with Christ. It is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. And the, the life we now live together, we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself up for us. The second prayer is prayer for family. Another critical part of our identity is that we are family. If you and I belong to God, if we are adopted sons and daughters, then that makes us brothers and sisters. We, we talk about this a lot because it's critical in our identity. It's a, it's a mystery. Paul talks about it with marriage and Christ's love for the church. It's a mystery how it all fits together. But here's the reality. The church is not like family. It is family. The body of Christ is actually our permanent 
eternal reality, our permanent eternal family. And that's hard for us to grasp a lot of times. And these are constantly terms that the early church uses. He is our father. We are brothers and sisters. And I want us to be intentional about praying for this identity to grow. That we would not see one another as kind of like family, but that we would see each other as family. Well, what's the difference? When we see each other like family, that's how we feel about close friends that we choose. Right? They talk about friends of the family that you get to choose. Well, church is the family that God chose for you. We don't get to choose. And so that's why we don't, we don't look at it and say, okay, well, we don't set up a lot of things to say, hey, well, we want to help you find people who are just like you, who are in the same life stage as you, who think the same way as you, who like the same hobbies as you. We don't organize around that because we think that that robs us of some of the joy of being actually the family. A family of God has a mixture of interests. It has a mixture of, of backgrounds. It has a mixture of ages, right? And so we want to function as that, as family. It's one of the reasons why we say that here at our church, if you're new, then you may not know this, but um, we encourage everyone, if you're a member here, that if you can um, pass a background check and you're physically able, then we expect you to jump in and help a few times a year on Sunday morning with the kids. You get paired with a teacher. You're not, your job isn't to, to teach the lesson or anything. Your big job is typically to help with hot chocolate or snacks or to sit down next to some squirrely boys and make sure they don't distract everybody, which is not really that difficult. But it's a great way to connect as God's family because these are your nieces and nephews, actually. Not like your nieces and nephews. They are your nieces and nephews. And why would you not want to get to know them? Actually, don't answer that. There may be reasons why it pop into your head <laughs> with your fleshly nieces and nephews. But I want us to be intentional about praying for this identity to grow. So, so this, is the, this is the passage I want us to pray together from 1 Peter. He says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Peter is giving instructions to the church that is in exile. They're outsiders. They're facing persecution. And Peter's encouragement to them is this. Have unity of mind. By that he means a mind that is transformed by Christ. Be united around Christ. And that mind comes from the last prayer. That as we're being formed more and more into the image of Christ, we will find ourselves having more and more unity around Christ. Doesn't mean that we're all going to think the same way or speak the same way or reach the same conclusions on, and on everything. It means that we are thinking with the mind of Christ, that we have unity around him. And we say Christ is preeminent. He is the most important. And we are united around him. So we pray for unity in the body of Christ. Pray for everyone to experience brotherly and sisterly love. Remember, arguably the most powerful testimony of the early church was that people who should not have been able to get along, not only got along, but they took responsibility for one another in ways that looked like they thought they were family. Like they took responsibility for one another in ways that you would not say, oh, they must be good friends. They took responsibility for one another where they said, that's something that you only do if that's your family. And the world could not explain how that was happening between Jews and Gentiles, poor and wealthy. They couldn't explain it. And we live in a culture where we've seen the kind of division that can be caused even within our blood families. See, many people over the last few years have grieved over their families being torn apart by politics. But let me tell you what the early church had to overcome to be the church was far bigger differences than Republican or Democrat. Far bigger than vaccine or not. You had people gathering together as the church who literally looked at each other and thought, you are not human. 
There's hatred and sometimes murder and other crimes that would have been seen as in dehumanizing ways where they say, you are not, you're, you're subhuman. And now those people, redeemed by Christ, growing into the image of Christ, came together and said, you're my brother, you're my sister. And notice that he's calling them to have sympathy and a tender heart and a humble mind. So we would see one another in that way. Listen, there are some here, some of you here feel like you're a burden. You feel like, for whatever reason, that you're not desired. Maybe because you, you feel like an outsider. Or maybe because you don't fit in the world. Maybe you, because of mental illness. Maybe you just feel like you've always been socially awkward. Or maybe you just have so much baggage from your past that you feel like you'll just never fully experience this. That you'll never fully experience being known and loved. Not so here. Christ covers all of it. You are loved. I hesitate to share this illustration, but I'm going to go, have, go for it. Maybe it's lack of sleep. I was in the community. Somebody, I was talking with somebody, and I found out a connection they had, and they, they asked about somebody that goes to church here. Somebody that has battled a lot of things, struggled. Let's say this. Somebody that has been trying to pursue Christ, but it's kind of messy. And they don't always come off the right, you know, the way that you might hope. And so it was clear that this person in the community had a bad experience. Now, my guess is right now that doesn't narrow it down at all. I'm sure all of us can like think of people like, oh, if this was the one experience they had with me, they probably wouldn't get a great picture of me and they probably wouldn't get a great picture of the church. So this person's saying like, oh. And I could tell, okay, you must not have had a very good experience. And this is what I said. I said, yeah, they're a bit of a mess, huh? And this person goes, yeah, I'll say. And I said, but they're our mess. We love them and shared a little testimony of my own mess, saying that we're a people that we are not, we haven't fully arrived. We're not gonna be perfect in our interactions, but we belong to one another. And in Christ, we are being formed from one degree of, to another in glory into his image. None of us are finished works. And I remember thinking, like, that's, that's how we should talk of our family. So, listen, if you feel like you're a mess, then just know it's okay. You're our mess. And we love you. And we'll be in the midst of it. And hopefully you love me even though I'm a mess. But in Christ, we are united. We are bonded together. Forgiven, redeemed, renewed, and adopted as sons and daughters, and therefore brothers and sisters. That's why when we take communion, we don't take it individually. We take it gathered around the table. Old, young, rich, poor. Every division that the world would want to throw at you. I don't want to freak you out, but sometimes you take communion with Democrats. <laughs> and others of you take it with Republicans. Those are your brothers and sisters. And so we want to pray this together. And one of the best ways to maintain that unity and grow in that affection for one another is to pray for one another, to pray this for ourselves and for one another, but then to actually pray for one another. And the two best ways to do that are, like one of them is just from a distance. We said this before, I'm gonna say it again. If you think of someone, pray for them. And if you pray for them, let them know. I can't tell you how encouraging it is to just get a random text from somebody and saying, hey, God put you on my heart today. I wanna pray for you. And then maybe like a little short, they might even text me a little short prayer or just text them and let them know that you're praying for them. And the other is pray for them in person. 
Don't just tell people that you're going to pray for them, but actually stop and pray for them. And I cannot tell you how much joy it fills me with when after the service I'm, I'm talking with people and then off in a corner somewhere I see somebody, people laying hands on someone else and praying for one another. Do it. It's amazing. And today we're going to do that and we're going to start doing that more and more after the service. We're going to offer prayer after the service. Come forward and receive prayer. Let us pray for you. Let us go to God on behalf of you, our brother, our sister. And then finally, we are God's family on mission. See, God did not just redeem us as a family to have cookouts together and celebrate birthdays together. And sometimes in the church, we get to that. We say, oh yeah, we belong to God. Yes, we belong to one another. And that's why we want to keep everybody else out and we're just going to hang out and have parties together. No. God's very clear of why he rescued you and me and formed us together. Again, in 1 Peter, he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So yes, I have examples sometimes where I get to say, yeah, there are mess. But then there are many, many, many other times where I get so many awesome interactions with people because they'll say like, oh, hey, so-and-so goes there. They are so kind to me at work. Oh, you're part of that church. I have a friend that goes there. They, they've really helped me and provided for me when we were struggling. Or I've really seen a change in my neighbor. Or my family member is different. And I want to know what this is. FYI, these are not hypothetical things that people have said to me. These are real things that people have said to me. And I get to say, yeah, isn't that incredible? See, the reason God has formed us and placed us here is so that we might be living testimony to those who are lost and hurting and spiritually dead. That God is calling them out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And the lie we tend to believe is that the world doesn't want to hear it. We believe all the news headlines that that our culture is anti-Christian, anti-Christianity. But let me tell you something. The world has always been against the kingdom of God. And the response of the kingdom of God is to go into that and to be salt and light. The lie that, well, people aren't really interested is debunked. It's debunked by Jesus in Luke 10 when he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And this is what I want us to pray. I want us to pray this together. It's such a wild statement to me from Jesus. He's saying the problem isn't that people don't want to know. The problem is we don't have enough people to go and tell them and to tell them in a Christ-honoring way. See, when you look at our culture, what do you see the problem as? Is it the culture's hardness of heart, or is it ours? Is it that they've turned away from God, and they've become disinterested? Or is it that we've withdrawn and stopped living lives that declare his glory? And it's true that some aren't interested, and it's true that many won't respond, but there are many people that you are interacting with on a daily basis who are lost sons and daughters. And God is saying, I want to reach them. I'm going to reach them. I want you to be a part of it. We've used this illustration before, but imagine if you walked into a room of 10 people and you knew that nine of them would reject the gospel and think that you are a fool for believing it. But one of them would respond and find life in Christ. Would you tell them? Would you run that risk? Would you be willing to look foolish? Would you go from a place of humility and be one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread? Or would you kind of want to protect your own pride and your own standing and And have to be the one who looks like you're right, looks like you're wise, looks like you have it together, looks like you're morally superior, because that is not the way of Jesus. Who did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but lowered himself, 
humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. That is who we are formed into the image of. And that is who we should be praying that God would send out into the harvest. Those are the kinds of laborers we want. Laborers who've been formed into the image of Jesus and who go out as brothers and sisters out into the field for the harvest. Years ago, I I planted a church in Denver. And when I decided to go to Denver, unbeknownst to me, I I was one of several that were an answer to prayer. That sounded kind of arrogant. Sound like it was an answer to prayer. It doesn't happen a lot. Um, but I will say this, that there are a bunch of us, and they had been praying for us. What I mean is that those who are responsible, those who are responsible in Denver for recruiting church planters to try to get people to come to start new churches in Denver, they made a decision one day. They decided to stop recruiting. They stopped going to conferences. They stopped blasting seminaries with invitations to come to Colorado to start a church. They stopped doing everything, and they started praying. And what they prayed was this, every single day. And all of a sudden, people were coming out of the woodwork to say, I I think I'm supposed to plant a church in Denver. And it was so great because then when that started happening, people from other cities were like, man, so many people are coming to Denver to plant churches. Like, what strategy did you use? Like, how did you, what conferences did you go to? And they're like, none. We prayed. Well, yeah, yeah, I know you prayed, but what else did you do? Nothing. Literally nothing. What if we prayed that? What if we prayed this together? Lord, send out laborers in the harvest. Lord, Lord, send me as a laborer out into the harvest. Send out laborers who are formed into the image of Jesus, who have been crucified with Christ, who count their own standing as nothing, but just go to serve and love and to tell people about the Jesus who has saved me and redeemed me and made me new and rescued me and made me a son or daughter of the King. Humble because we know that it is by grace we have been saved, overflowing with the fruit of the Spirit, not arrogant or self-reliant, full of compassion and patience and gentleness, laboring together as a family with brotherly affection for one another. What if we prayed this? Because the harvest is plentiful. And we can do that specifically by praying for our church plant. You know, as many of you know by now, we've announced that we're going to be planting a church, starting a new church in Marinette. Because we just want to have a gospel presence there. We feel compelled to go. And there's so many people who are lost and hurting. And we want to be God's family on mission in Marinette. And so pray for us. Pray that God would speak to those who are supposed to join the team. And pray for um, a prospective church planter. That we would have a person that God is calling to say, I, I want to go plant that church. And then pray that people would rally around that and say, yes, I will go and give my life to see the gospel spread in Marinette. Pray that you would be a laborer sent into the field. Pray for lost people that you know. Pray for your coworkers. Pray for the surrounding communities that as we share, that we're also sharing in, in Menominee and in Coleman and in Crivets and O'Connell. That every workplace would be filled, that we would pray, Lord, send laborers into the harvest and let every workplace be filled with declarations and demonstrations of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray. Every time that you're walking into a store, that you'd say, God, here I am. Send me. If there's somebody in this grocery store, somebody in this coffee shop that needs to know about you, that you are reaching right now, send me. I'm here. Pray for opportunities to share with others, to invite them to our church family, to say, hey, I want you to come and see. What would happen if we committed to praying these prayers, that we would be crucified with Christ, that we would grow in our understanding of what it means that we no longer live, but it is Christ who lives in us, that we die to ourselves. What if we prayed that we would have brotherly affection for one another? What if we prayed that God would send out laborers into the harvest? our community of faith, our family growing so that others would say, well, I don't know what's going on there, but that church is full of joy 
They really love one another. And something's happening there. Listen, I don't know why God is doing what he is doing here right now. I've said that a lot, and I've tried to figure it out, even as I got back from teaching at seminary again and trying to explain it as we're sharing some of the things and, and other people hearing the stories and saying, that's something really unique and powerful. And sometimes when you're in the midst of it, you, you think it's kind of normal, but it's, it's not actually. Like what God is doing here, I don't know why he's doing it. It's not because of me. Like, I'm a, I'm a failed church planter who's battled depression, has ADD, and can't fill out a proper expense report. Can I, Lisa? No, I really can't. And it's not you, because you're, well, you, you know. Let's be real, right? Like, look around. And I think about that in the early church. Like, can you imagine as they're seeing all these incredible things happen, what do they see when they look around? Common, uneducated men and women that nobody else wanted, that were outcasts. Some of them were wealthy and influential, but they gave it all up to be a part of this. So if they ever were someone, they gave it up. And what's happening? People's lives are being changed. We have prayer every day in our schools. We have people loving people and sharing the hope of Jesus in factories and hospitals and jails and police cars and firehouses. Things are changing. And they're changing because you and the person next to you and me are all being transformed into the image of Jesus day by day, moment by moment, from one degree of glory to another. And we're walking with Jesus as he's saying, hey, hand me that nail. Hey, let me show you how to paint that wall. And just by faith, we say, okay. So let's pray that God would do more. Pray, Lord, make me more like Jesus. Let me die to myself more. I want more of you. I want you to renovate every part of me. Lord, do more in us as a family. Let us love one another more deeply with brotherly affection. Lord, do more in our community. Send us out into the harvest and let us see that harvest. All for the glory of God's name, for the sake of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we come before you as your children. And Lord, as we've been praying and and discussing, we don't come to you as fully self-reliant, sufficient, adult-grown children that have anything to offer you. Lord, we come as toddlers. We don't have anything to offer you that you don't already have. And anything we do give to you, Lord, you gave to us first. And yet it is your joy to share your glory with us. It is your joy to patiently and with kindness go into each room of our heart and renovate it that we might become more like you. So Lord, let us be crucified with Christ. Let us die to ourselves. Lord, make it so it's no longer us who live, but you who lives in us. You who gave yourself for us, who loved us and gave yourself up for us. And Lord, let us grow as your family. Let us have unity in our minds, the mind of Christ. Let us be humble and sympathetic and have tender hearts towards one another and demonstrate brotherly and sisterly affection. And Lord, send us. We know the harvest is plentiful. We are constantly around people who desperately need you. And we know this because we desperately need you. Lord, let us from that place of a tender heart and humble and brotherly affection, let us share your glory. Let us tell people about the Jesus who has renovated our hearts. Let us invite them into this family to come and see. Lord, let it all be for your glory. And Lord, I pray for those in this room right now who are saying, I, I'm not a part of that. I don't know. Lord, I pray that you would move in them. I pray, God, that you would make it known to them in their heart that you are 
the God of the Bible. You are who you say you are, and you have done what you say you have done. And Lord, that they would be compelled to turn from a life of rebellion against you for living their own, for their own lives and their own worlds and their own kingdoms and repent and turn and find forgiveness and redemption and renewal and life. We pray all this, Lord, for your glory and our joy. In the name of Jesus, amen.